If you sit near the fan section, yep. that is like half the entertainment right yes. there for me. Mm. Just watch it. You have like a hype squad. Kind we of do. Thing. That's our belly brothers. Belly brothers. Yes. <laughs> our belly brothers. So they're the ones that lift their shirt up when. Shout, uh, out, shout out to the belly that's brothers. That's it. <laughs> I don't know if they claim this or what's out there, but when the opposing team is shooting a free throw against the belly brothers, when uh-huh. the belly brothers in the background, yeah, yeah, yeah. theoretically, they are, I think, like the second <laughs> lowest free throw percentage when they're there <laughs> versus anybody else in the country. And welcome to another episode of The Bandit Room. My name is Charles. We're joined here in the studio today by Mr. Caleb. Hello again. How you been? Good. Doing all right. Mm-hmm. Uh, Aggie is not with us today. Uh, today we have our special guest is Mr. Chuck Ray. How are you doing, Chuck? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Or Coach Ray, as many people know you. Sometimes. Yeah. Coach, uh, Coach Ray, uh, you served as the volleyball coach for a number of seasons at the University of Winthrop, and now you serve as the athletic director. Um that's a brief summary of your experience yeah. at Winthrop. Uh, would you like to go into a little more detail on, on all the different things? So in your role, you oversee 17 Division One sports. Uh, how do you do all that? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Yeah, and so yeah. certainly a little bit more untraditional route. Yeah. Although if you look back maybe 20, 30 years ago, it may not have been so untraditional for a coach to become an athletic director and or a coach to be an athletic director. Okay. Uh, okay. At one time here at Winthrop University, a uh, um, athletic director and basketball coach, men's basketball coach by the name of Neil Gordon. Mm-hmm. He was the athletic director and men's basketball coach. Oh, and wow. I, simultaneously. I, simultaneously. Okay. <laughs> so I think with uh, NCAA compliance these days and the way money is thrown around, I think people probably started to get a little uneasy about having a basketball coach who's directing the whole athletic department. Uh, but <laughs> as uh, as athletics might, have grown... Lean a certain way. Well, maybe you would, maybe you wouldn't. Uh, you know, at Winthrop, we uh, were uh, an all-women's college until, you know, the, the early 70s. And mm. so, uh, you know, our women's basketball team and our women's sports have always been prominent and well-known here. And being a volleyball coach at one time here at Winthrop was really quite an honor. Uh, we, we don't have football here at Winthrop University. And I, I say that as we're still undefeated here <laughs> as, as people say our, our football team. But... Uh, Volleyball typically is the same time of year as football, and, and so they get a little bit overshadowed by football at some schools, not yeah. all, but mm-hmm. some schools. And so, uh, you know, we got a little bit more of the limelight, per se, as a volleyball coach. And yeah, uh, we went through a lot of changes here at Winthrop in, in good ways and maybe, you know, ways that were more challenging. Um, over the last 10 years before President Cerna got here, we had a, a bit of leadership changes mm-hmm. in terms of presidents and Interim presidents, we had this thing called COVID, which you might mm. be familiar with. <laughs> yeah, what is that? Uh, what is that, right? I forgot about it. And, uh, you know, at the time, we still had an interim president. And uh, I, I said to, at the time, we went through three athletic directors. I said to one of them, and, and that was in a year, three athletic directors in a year. I said, I'm willing to help out any way I can help you out. Just let me know. And uh, sure enough, the third athletic director leaves. And the president at the time, you know, he says, hey, can you go pick up the next athletic director to the airport and the interim athletic director? I said, sure, no problem. And so about an hour later, he says, oh, by the way, they're not coming. He says, would you have interest in helping us out in that way? <laughs> <laughs> so I tell people I'm still helping out in that way. You're still helping out. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. That's right. So a long-term. Yeah, that's right. Open out. Okay, that's <laughs> fantastic. Yeah. Now, before you were coaching, uh, my understanding is you spent 10 years uh, as the co-owner of an international marketing that's right. and logistics company. Yeah. Um, tell us about that. How, yeah. did, how did you move? Uh, let's talk your background and, and what, sure. what sent you into your professional sure. career first. So I grew up in Chicago. Yeah. Um, big sports fan in Chicago. Got yeah. to play baseball most of my life. Was a big Cubs fan. And uh, then I realized that my size wasn't going to exactly get me to be a major league baseball player. So I moved into volleyball. Who'd have thought it? You know, somebody 5'9 is going to move into volleyball. But okay. I actually got to play on the first boys high school volleyball team in Illinois, in the state of Illinois, which yeah. was pretty cool. And so that's what kind of got my path in sports and, and athletics and volleyball. And that's what led me in that way. Uh, but, you know, at the same time, my father had a business, a family business. We were an international marketing company. We would import product from Asia, um, consumer goods, electronics, housewares, um, luggage, those types of things, and sell it here in the United States through credit card billing statements. And so 
way back in the day before there was the internet, you actually had to pay your bills through the mail. <laughs> and, and when you received that, there was a little tear off on those bills that uh, would be a separate product. And that product is what we did. Mm. And as it kind of evolved, we got into catalogs, we did some infomercial things. And I did that until um, my early 30s and had a, uh, um, a change in heart. I think business-wise, at least for me, not for everybody, it's a little bit selfish and self-centered. How much can you aggregate, build, dwell for yourself versus what can you kind of give back? And so um, I was mm-hmm. living in Hilton Head at the time and uh, had a friend of mine that said, hey, why don't you come help coach? And, uh, you know, I was still involved with volleyball a little bit, but I started on the club side. I started in the uh, um, high school side, and that spun off into coaching collegiately. Mm-hmm. And so then I spent 15 years coaching collegiately from Georgia Southern University, University of Minnesota, Winthrop, mm-hmm. uh, Miami of Ohio, and then back to Winthrop. So I've had two wow. tours of duties at Winthrop starting in 2008 was my first tour. Gotcha. And so it's really given me a unique pers- perspective to be a part of a university to go away from the university and then come back to the university. Yeah. And uh, mm-hmm. we have another young man that's part of our uh, athletic staff, Tommy Henry, did just did the same thing. He was at Winthrop and then went to Belmont University and then has now back at Winthrop. And that perspective, I think, uh, helps to maybe broaden the horizons and opportunities that you might not see if you're always part of uh, one mm-hmm. particular university. Mm-hmm. But yeah. What was yeah. the gap there? On your yeah, it was five years. Five years? It was okay. five years I was there. And so there was a lot of changeover mm-hmm. at that time. I was here at the end of what's kind of known as the Campus of Champions. And I don't want to say the end, so let's say we're going to say the resurgence soon coming of <laughs> Campus of Champions. But uh, I started here, or I, I left here in 2012, and so there was a longtime president here uh, by the name of Tony DiGiorgio. He was here for uh, many, many years, and I think his vision and somebody just being in a place for 25 years mm-hmm. and that consistency, you get to grow something and see it grow which I think all across, and then with, as I said, the changeover, and I, I called it the hiccup at the time, the hiccup that was going on with Winthrop. I missed the hiccup, mm-hmm. and I came back to Winthrop, and it, it is still this great place. Yeah. Um, one of the things I often say about my return is that when I left Winthrop, I left a lot of really good people, and that's mm-hmm. just not in terms of at Winthrop, but also the sur- surrounding community. There's an incredible Winthrop family, the whole mm-hmm. support family in this mm-hmm. area, and then when I left, I just say on the volleyball side, we didn't quite do as well. And it's not because of my leaving. It's just, mm-hmm. I think, all the changes that happened. And then when we came back, um, the same people that were supporting us before, when we were successful, they were still supporting us when we weren't successful. Mm-hmm. I, I think that just talks about the loyalty yeah. of the fan base that we have here and the people that are here. Mm-hmm. And it, it hasn't been smooth since that time. Now, we've won some championships since that time, but um, there's still been transition. And there, the people are here and that's people, why do you come back to Winthrop? I said, it's a great place. Yeah. And it really is a great place. Yeah. Yeah. When you're referring to the fan base for the volleyball team, um, would you say a, a large part of it has been consistent over the years? Very uh, much I mean, so. a, a lot of it, I'm sure, is family of the yeah. players, but those are always changing. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, but yeah. Yeah. yeah, there's been a lot of consistency in the yeah. people, um, and they really do become family. Mm-hmm. Um, not just the volleyball, but all our programs have typically um, some moms and dads, grandparents, and, and uh, that look over our teams, invite them to the houses, have meals with them, um, take them in in a special way to make sure that our student athletes, especially those that are um, from other states or even internationally, they've mm-hmm. got a home here and they recognize they have a home here. And, it, it's funny because when you're recruiting, and I still do it now for our teams when they bring recruits in, they say uh, every recruiting visit, these student athletes, re- prospective student athletes that they hear, um, I hear, I hear that it's going to be a family. It's a really nice family. Mm-hmm. And I always ask them, I say, make sure when you talk about a family, it, is it a real family or a dysfunctional family? Right. So what kind of family <laughs> is it really? And so we go on from there. <laughs> Everything could be a family. <laughs> that, that, that's the whole point. They get it every every place they go. They hear it's a family, and yeah. we really are a family at Winthrop, and it's yeah. a neat place to be. That's mm-hmm. good. Now, uh, describe a little bit. You talked about how you, you wanted to play baseball originally, and then you kind of switched into volleyball. Uh, let's talk a little bit about that background. What uh, led you to make that kind of switch, and then what eventually led you to want to become a coach? Sure. So, yeah. Sure. I, you know, the switch happened. Um, because it was God's will and God's way. Yeah. Uh, I, I literally, and I, I tell this as a joke, but it's truth, mm-hmm. in that uh, when I graduated high school, I was five foot three, and I, I weighed less than 110 pounds. And so sophomore year, mm-hmm. uh, I went to a school that had 4,000 students in it, 
And I went from um, a freshman program that had a, an A and a B team to then I had to make the JV team. Mm-hmm. And uh, being 5'3", I was able to wrestle in the 90 pound and under super flyweight class. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I literally couldn't throw the ball from center field to home. Yeah. And I realized this wasn't strong. <laughs> and so three days later, they started volleyball at my high school. Oh, wow. And so it just happened by chance. My stepfather played volleyball. I had some knowledge of it. And so I got involved in that particular way. And just come to find out that Chicago area has a great uh, base of volleyball players. I was able to expand out with some other, um, a, a couple players that went on to the Olympic team, won some gold medals and got to play with them, went on to Arizona State, and I played a, played a few years out there. And then, um, you know, after I was done, so to speak, in the collegiate world, I, I got in the business world, but still played on the side. Okay. And so through that time, I, like I said, I continued to play. And literally, I was playing at the beach one day, and somebody says, hey, why don't you come help out? And uh, it's just kind of that bug. You never get yeah. rid of that bug, that yeah. athletics mm-hmm. bug, the sports bug. And uh, it just stuck. And I realized then and there that I can really help students. I can really help young people, guide and mentor them mm-hmm. in a way that you can't do. Uh, you know, and teaching is a very special profession because, mm-hmm. as you know, you don't do it for the money. So, I mean, my first job was $16,000 a year. And yeah. then I, I lost that job because a new head coach came in. And so I had to go find, and so my next job was a volunteer job, yeah. you, you know? <laughs> and so you kind of find and you make your way. And yeah. um, there's a purpose and reason for everything. So it's been a neat journey. Yeah, Thanks. fantastic. Describe the transition from coach to athletic director. I mean, I'm sure losing a lot of the sort of direct working mm-hmm. with the athletes mm-hmm. one-on-one sure. as a coach, and then you switch to athletic director, you're primarily dealing with coaches, sure. I assume, in that, sure. that kind of role. So yeah, yeah. how did that uh, yeah. transition go for you? Well, there are a couple perspectives. People ask me if I still miss coaching, and, mm-hmm. and honestly, I'm still coaching every day, just yeah. coaching somebody else in yeah. a different way. And I also relate uh, what I do now. I've gone from being a parent to now the grandparent. <laughs> gotcha. So I get the kids when they're really good, or yeah. I get the kids when they're really not so good. <laughs> <laughs> and so... Uh, um, but it's really, I try to get to know the student athletes as best we can. I mean, I see them coming through the Coliseum front door all the time yeah. saying hello. We're really trying to build an encouraging, empowering environment that's going to develop leaders to graduate as champions. Mm-hmm. And, and through that, as we continue to, to move them in that way, it's just those touch points and opportunities for us to surround these student athletes in a positive way. And my, my role in a couple ways is... I, I've got to find people that are really passionate about what they do, really enjoy what they do, because when they do that, it just bleeds through them, and they become very inspiring and invigorating for others that want to follow them. Um, and, and then continue to find people that are good, positive influences in, in ways for them, student-athletes, to be surrounded in those ways. So those that's kind of you know a very surface level, I think, of what I do. I think mm-hmm. some of the most challenging parts of making that transition uh, was within the coaching staff. And I've known a lot of these coaches for years and years and have great respect for them. And quite honestly, many of them are better coaches than me and quite honestly could be better athletic directors than me too. Mm-hmm. But um, it's it's you go from colleague to boss. And, and not just within the coaches, but also the administration. You have people, especially nowadays, you have in collegiate athletics, lifetime administrative people. Um, as I said, way back in the day, it used to be coaches that became athletic directors, and mm-hmm. it still happens, but not as often now. So, you know, theoretically, I'm not saying anybody in our uh, athletic department is this way, but like mm-hmm. maybe they were vying for the job or maybe that they thought they should be, you know, considered in those particular ways. And so it's earning the trust and respect of the people. Um, yeah. I try to work really hard every day, I try to create an environment that's positive influence for them that, that they can grow. And, I think some of the challenges with mid-major schools, Division One schools on our size, is that we're always chasing the big guys, mm-hmm. and the big guys have 100 times more money than we do. Yeah. Um, and, and yet, how do we grow and help them to grow and develop as professionals so that they can achieve what they want to achieve, and we can reward them accordingly? Nice. Mm-hmm. Now, um, we talked a little bit about this before, but like, what's the process for you to follow all of the sports that you've managed. You said the 17 <laughs> different programs, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, so, I mean, there's not enough hours in the day to right. watch every single game. You said you've got a softball doubleheader today, That's right? right. That, yeah, That's tonight, right. Yeah, tonight. Recording. Yep. But, um, yeah, so what, what is your process? You just catch as many games as you can and then kind of get, follow the data for the rest? Or, or th- how does that work? I, I think it depends on who you ask. If yeah. you ask my wife, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she says, what are you doing? <laughs> if you ask my boss, he's like, you're not there enough. Right. <laughs> What's really interesting is that is that people are very genuine in what they say, meaning that 
I want you to have a well-balanced life. Mm -hmm. I I want you to um, make sure you have time for your family. Your family's the ultimate, most important, and don't get me wrong, it is. Yeah. And and they want that for you until they want you at their event. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then when you're not at their event, they're like, "Where are you?" <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, it, you know, people see you only at the times of their events. They don't recognize that you're at all the other events too. Mm-hmm. And so um, I have not yet found that balance yeah, yet. Yeah. And um, part of it is being new in this profession again, uh, in this role again, proving myself making sure that I do have the respect of our coaches as well as our staff, because a lot of our staff is at every event. And yeah. quite honestly, I don't have to be at every event because I've got something else going on somewhere else. Mm-hmm. And so our real heroes and champions are, you know, our, our facilities guy, Wade Campbell. I mean, he's everywhere all the time. When the Trump yeah. rally came in, he was here at three in the morning, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. and the next day we had a basketball game at two. Yeah. You know, James Grigg on our facility yeah. side. I mean, Charles Archuleta for our ticket staff. I mean, they're, they're there all the time. Our marketing, you know, Anthony Peterson, our marketing, they're doing some things that are above and beyond. And um, so going back to the, the question of, I'm understanding the rhythms and the cycles of, of athletic directing. I did for coaching. And so when's your time off and when's not your time off? We get very overwhelmed throughout a week because we have so much going on. And sometimes we forget in the summer, we don't have as much going on and we can take a few weeks off where I think traditionally in the business world, which I've been in, you can't take those same times. And so um, it's, it's a balance and it's, it's not a fair balance yet. And I hope it gets (laughs) to be more. Yeah. Yeah. Now, the world of college sports is, is changing a lot, and, and Winthrop seems to be on the forefront of that with the non-traditional options mm-hmm. that you're starting to provide. Sure. Uh, things that jump into my head are things like cornhole yeah. or uh, eSports. Sure. Uh, talk a little bit about that, about how, how those things are being worked into the, uh, the world of the sure. athletic department at Winthrop. Well, uh, college athletics is changing a whole lot. Yeah. I say now I'm glad I'm not a coach anymore. <laughs> it, you know, I look at our, our basketball programs. They just finished their, their season and literally, you know, they're looking for the next athlete already. They don't get mm. a break anymore, yeah. and it's really, really hard. And we are doing some pretty cool transformative things at Winthrop with some of these alternative sports, club sports that we're yeah. doing. But I want to always make sure that we don't um, overlook what our, our intercollegiate programs do and have done. I mean, we're the winningest program in the Big South Conference for conference championships of active schools with 75 Mm -hmm. conference championships. We have 16 co-sided. Those are academic All-Americans and 26 All-Americans. Our our track and field team just took third in the Big South Conference Championship for indoor meet, and our men won the 4x400, which is an incredible race for them. Mm -hmm. It's the best they've done in 20 years for that particular program. And so, like I said, the club sports, the e-sports, the cornhole, the the disc golf, those are the shiny new things, Mm -hmm. and those are really cool to to look at. But... Mm -hmm. There's still a basis of our sports programs that have done incredible and continue mm-hmm. to do incredible. Our volleyball coach, yep. you know, Heather Gerhardt, our poor young head coach who, you know, started in her mid-20s because I was balancing between being athletic director and head coach at a time, and, and she helped guide that program and earn the opportunity for her to become the head coach of the program. And, you know, she's, you know, two years in a row gotten that program to the conference championship, second place in the, in the conference, and, you know, doing some good things there. So, yeah. uh, again, w- when you go back to talk about earning the respect of the coaches, I think sometimes our coaches might not understand and see why we do the club sports and what we're doing. In some ways, esports has been an anomaly in a way that the other club sports are growing, that we've won two national championships yeah. in, in esports. Uh, mm-hmm. We just had a um, one of our teams, our Valorant team, yeah. uh, it became a professional team, is able to play professionally, the first team ever collegiately that is now playing professionally, and some of those uh-huh. guys are actually earning money. Wow. They're not NCAA so, sponsored, so they yeah. can do some crazy things and earn money and do those kind of things, which is, which is really, really neat. And so... Um, you know, it's balancing the two of making sure we recognize our club sports and what they're doing. You know, it's pretty cool that cornhole and disc golf are able to do what they do, but that's what we do here in Rock Hill. Mm-hmm. I mean, 25 years now, we've had the U.S. Disc Golf Championships yeah, here right on, on a course at Winthrop yep. that's known as the Masters type course for disc yeah, golf. Yeah. But yet at Winthrop, we have in some ways taken advantage of it, but not to our fullest extent in marketing that because we have people coming from all over the world that are coming for our disc golf course. And so how do we make that better? How do we take care of that and grow that? And so we've had a disc golf team here in the past, but 
recognizing that it's a club sport that's been student-led. When those students leave, all of a sudden you might not have a team, and we didn't. Mm -hmm. And so if we can start to add a coach to it and provide consistency, retention for our students here, and maybe even recruiting, now it becomes a whole other tool that Mm -hmm. we can grow the university. As we grow the university, athletics, intercollegiate athletics, is led by student fees. More students means yeah. our budget becomes bigger and we have more fees, uh, more, more opportunities to earn for our uh, intercollegiate teams too. So it's kind of a two-edge, two-pronged process there. Interesting, yeah. yeah. What, would you, um, what would you say to the person that argues that things like cornhole and sure. esports are not athletic yeah, they, enough they, to be considered I, I, I Well, I'll put it to you this way. On yeah. the cornhole side... Uh, you know, a hundred years ago, mm-hmm. Yale started this sport called bowling. Yeah. Now they didn't actually start bowling, but yeah. they were the first team that started collegiate. And Yale's okay. a pretty good school. Yeah. You, you know, we can compare ourselves in those. And now there's over a hundred schools that are NCAA schools that are offering scholarships for for bowling. So yeah. we're we're not much different in that way. If you yeah. haven't been to the American Cornhole League headquarters here in Rock Hill, it's an awesome place. Yeah. And, and bring your friends there and you go out for a night of bowling, we'll go out for a night of cornhole yeah. in those particular ways. And esports is is something very different. And I think it's really cool. We've got a young man on the team, Moobs, M O O B S is his name. I don't even know his real name. And I don't know half these guys' real names, <laughs> which is probably terrible. But I love these guys. They're they're yeah. really great guys. Yeah. I really enjoy them and they're really good good young uh, young men. But he was a football player, yeah. and he, he doesn't look like what you're, you would think in your mind what an esports person looks like. Gotcha. And he, um, he blew out his knee, had a career-ending injury. Oh, wow. he, he's super competitive. Yeah. And, and so this gave him another opportunity for him to, you know, be, to get into school. And you know, there are 96% of the boys now in, in the high school that play hmm. some type of game, hmm. but yet... We have at Winthrop, we have almost 65% female, 35% male. And that's a demographic that's very similar across the country where less and less boys are going to become in, into college. And mm-hmm. so this is a way, and I, I you know, thank President Cerna, I thank our board of trustees to recognize that this is a way to meet these boys in the middle, mm-hmm. right? They're going to go home, they're going to go hide in their, in their bedrooms, or we can provide a space for them that is going to be for them to grow what they're really good at, Mm. but then we can attach to that the educational element that's going to get them to places where we've got, you know, opportunities in cybersecurity now Mm -hmm. at Winthrop and then after Winthrop. We have opportunity in computer science, Mm -hmm. our business school. And and so when you surround them again with the people that can help them to grow and mature, because they're not going to play esports the rest of their life, just like most of these guys aren't going to play basketball the rest of their lives and give them an opportunity to grow. It's a really cool thing that Winthrop is doing, and I appreciate the support in that way. Very cool. Now, speaking of that, uh, I saw that in the 2020 to 2021 academic year, you had a record high 3.35 GPA average for your Mm student-athlete population. Mm -hmm. Uh, What are some ways that you're effectively advocating for the uh, academic performance of your athletes? I don't know if that was the COVID year or not, Yeah. but the COVID year, they, they, it was very difficult to fail. Yeah. And so our GPA was really good that year, but okay. I can tell you, we did end up topping that year. So maybe that's the year gotcha. we topped it in okay, terms okay. of, but we have, I think it's now at least 14 or 15 years achieved above a 3.0 cumulative GPA for our department. And there's really one person that's um, been the consistent person who's Claire Mooney Melvin, who is. Um, been our academic services mm-hmm. um, 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 representative for athletics. Um, she is within um, our coliseum, mm-hmm. and um, she is now uh, assistant athletic director for academic services and our senior woman administrator, but she has led that charge for a long time. And she does an amazing job. We've been fortunate to have an assistant to help out to look after student athletes. We have uh, you know, criteria of study hall hours. We have criteria of tutors that are available for free for our student athletes. Mm-hmm. We have um, Claire and um, uh, Kathy Brown. Kathy, th- they will travel with the team if they have to, especially some of the long trips. Yeah. I mean, Claire had to go to Mexico last year. I mean, that was yeah. hard, yeah. It, you know, yeah. or, or, or I think, you know, we had somebody go to Cal Berkeley. I mean, if yeah. you got to go to these places, let's go to some nice places. Yeah. So, but, um, and, and then we've got incredible academic advisors on campus too that help guide us and some professors that understand that our student athletes are different and that they're going to miss a test they're going to miss a class Mm -hmm. and we're grateful for those professors that understand that they're doing so much more um, not just then athletics but athletics and 
I can tell you too that every board of trustees meetings and every meeting that I have a chance to talk about our student athletes, I always make sure we say student first, athlete second. And I, my first slide is always our GPA. Now, mm -hmm. if we get below a 3.0, it might not always be my first slide, yeah. but uh, right now it's going to be yeah. my first slide and okay. will continue to be no matter what we're doing. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. fantastic. So that, I mean, you know, contributes to what you were referring to earlier about, you know, making them, making sure your, your athletes are also well-rounded individuals and that they're not all going to continue playing whatever mm -hmm. sport it is for the rest mm -hmm. of their life, but they're going to do other things as well. Um, let's see. Um, I, I can tell you that yeah. um, we hope that we're not just developing student athletes. Um, mm -hmm. Part of an initiative we have is what we call We Care. We, and CARE stands for Community and Relationships and how we can build our community relationships for our not just our students but our student athletes. And I kind of give the example of this small little company called Gatorade. Mm -hmm. And Gatorade started as, uh, you know, a, a drink down in Florida, yep. sports labs, mm -hmm. you know, for the University of Florida football team so that the guys wouldn't pass out, right. you know, during uh, the football days. And so if we can help our students, not student athletes, but our, our general population students find opportunities within the athletic department to intern and to grow and for yeah. workforce development opportunities... That's something that we like to continue, and we do so with our mass comm, like a lot of our um, uh, produced games, our television, or even radio produced games are done by our students, or at least help with our nutrition nice. side, sports psychology side, and so we're getting our professors involved because they're, they're doing some curriculum to help. We're getting our students involved to help them to grow data yeah. analytics. We've got some that are working up with the Panthers now, some yeah. with the Hornets, some with the Charlotte FC because of what they've done with athletics. Mm -hmm. and, and so then we connect the community with it too and businesses mm -hmm. in this area. And so if businesses are listening, we want our students and even student athletes mm -hmm. to be able to work in your places here locally, especially. I know we have one just uh, um, uh, signed on with founders as mm -hmm. their first job out of, out of school. And a lot of it has to do with what they've been doing here yeah. at Winthrop with athletics. And so it's been a really neat ride to watch those student athletes in that way. That's cool. So awesome. uh, referring to like student roles and, and the games and things like that, uh, I've attended some basketball games recently and uh, surely you're, you've got a professional commentator that you've he's got a, amazing you've, isn't you've he got a really you got a fantastic <laughs> Brian production yeah, yeah make yeah, sure yeah. make sure you listen to him he's yeah. done a great job yeah. yeah he's really like the what do you refer to it? the mc or the host yeah, or yep. what is it? the yeah, pa yeah. announcer yep. PA, yeah yep. okay. sure yeah just fantastic job it's a full pro professional production yeah. you guys got going over there yeah. but one of the things that i was most impressed by was the, <laughs> if you sit near the fan section yep that is like half the entertainment right yes. there for me. Is mm. just watch it. You have like a hype squad. Kind we of do. Thing. That's our belly brothers. Belly brothers. Yes, <laughs> our belly brothers. So they're the ones that lift their shirt up when. Shout, uh, out, shout out to the belly that's brothers. It. The, they lift guys. their shirt. They they consider themselves the flock. Oh um, man, is what their student group is, and they're really trying to engage more students to get them out. And yeah, this is the first year that we've had a really packed student section. A number of different games. We've had close to three thousand at a few games, and yeah. they're a big portion of why yeah. they're helping to drive attendance back up to where it is. And We've been really, really over. I mean, uh, again, shout out to our marketing and uh, all the people that work at, uh, at yeah. the athletic side to really put on a good production. So yeah. our radio guys are just as good as our PA guy, too. Yeah. And well, cool. one thing that I was blown away by is like how effective they were mm. at, at also the heckling part of it. <laughs> because like, you, you know, they're, they're like the air ball, yes. or, you know, you, they have like, they're, they're so on yes. cue too. Yes. I don't know if don't know. you have a people that are kind of like prompting them or if they just so kind of all kind of that's know our, what to do in those that's moments. That's our, our pep band. So, yeah. you know, shout out to them too, because mm -hmm. they do an amazing job of knowing about when they should say things, what they can say. Yeah. Um, they do have it coordinated, even with our spirit squad, which yeah. continues to grow as well as our pep band continues to grow, which is really cool. Yeah. Coordinated with our belly brothers. <laughs> they, they are definitely an act. And so yeah, it's yeah. fun. It's fun to be with them. As a yeah. matter of fact, I just saw some of our spirit squad down in our um, um, <laughs> the Giorgio Center for some food. And they're like, oh, yeah. I haven't seen you here in a while. Going to the Big South Tournament was great. And to travel with them, it's just been a lot of fun for them. That's fun. Yeah. Because I, I was... I was more of a theater student in college as, as well as business, but um, that that seemed like the a perfect crossover of yeah. that kind of thing. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the little things they would do, like the uh, you know, air ball or yes. you know, the 50% or something like that. Yeah. Um, but one thing I was particularly struck by is you would start the countdown when the opposing team was the shot clock was running. That's down. right. That's right. You, they would start the, they would do a verbal countdown, but it would be like, 
a few seconds off. Yeah. And it would usually convince them yes. to shoot the ball yes. at the one, oh, which wow. is before their shot clock. And yeah. it, 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 it almost always miss in those scenarios. I, I was... Uh, I was um, with Dave Friedman, one of our old radio guys, and yeah. uh, some of our math professors here looking at doing a data analytics program yeah. here. And there's some studies out there, which is really interesting. Uh, during the COVID time, y- you can tell what home court advantage really meant or didn't mean because mm. teams were playing when there was no home court. Mm-hmm. And so it was something like a 5% shift in terms of points as well as uh, fouls that would be you know, given to a home team versus a visiting team because of how much the home team actually surrounds them. Oh. And mm-hmm. so when you say exactly something like that, yeah. they have that advantage to us because they do really shoot the ball early, yeah. which is awesome. Yeah. And then apparently, I don't know if they claim this or what's out there, but when the opposing team is shooting a free throw against the Belly Brothers, when uh-huh. the Belly Brothers in the background, yeah, yeah, yeah. theoretically, they are, I think, like the second <laughs> lowest free throw percentage when they're there <laughs> versus anybody else in the country. Well, so, that's fantastic. That's, that's, that's awesome. awesome. Yeah, that's it's funny. I remember one of the games in particular, that y'all had some promotion where, like, if the opposing team misses two free throws or something that's like that it. in the last yeah. quarter or something, I don't that's know. That's one of our Pizza gets Hut's commercials. Yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Tommy Henry's yeah. done an amazing and, job with that. And somebody did some it. Somebody, pizza some, companies. The opposing team missed two free Empire's throws. Empire's coming on to do that. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Because of the Belly Brothers, I'm guessing. That's fantastic. But yeah, that's, that's really something, man. Yeah. That, that kind of stuff is just yeah. wild to me. Um, but more on, on to more serious topics. Um you're you're also involved in um, FCA at Winthrop. Yes. Um, mm. Talk a little bit about that. What's how has that impacted you? Sure. Uh, were you involved in your college days as well? Sure. Or other experiences. I, I was not. I was not a, a believer until I, I came down here to uh, South Carolina. In that too, I often say that I was I was born born in the new, in the north, but born again in the south. <laughs> and uh, it's actually because of our coach's Bible study um, that uh, converted me into Christianity and uh, made me a believer. And so it's a, a, a coach's Bible study that I, I still get together with every Tuesday or Thursday morning um, with some of our great coaches, Sid Carvalho, who is our tennis coach here, who won twenty plus championships, Joe Hudak from our baseball program, and then we've got. Um, coaches that are currently coaching to help uh, guide them in those particular ways. And, you know, my life philosophy is to be- always believe in courage and love. And for me, believe is uh, believe in something higher, a greater power. Yeah. And these are things that I told our student athletes that I want them to believe in something more and a greater power. Um, I have grandparents um, on my mom's side that are from Poland mm-hmm. and they um, met in a concentration camp wow. and they, um, taken from their homes at 16. And through that, I read a book by Viktor Frankl called Man's Search for Meaning. And in that book, he talks about those that believe of something have an 80% greater chance of living than those that had nothing to believe in. Yeah. And so I have always in philosophy, always believed making sure that that a student athlete has the opportunity to know that there's freedom for them to believe in what they want to believe. I, I hope and maybe through my influence, I can guide them to what I believe in Jesus Christ as our Savior. Um, but that's up to... Uh, up to them, but we can provide that atmosphere. And we are super fortunate to have a young lady by the name of Angie Lanier, who is our FCA leader at Winthrop, who is part of my coach's Bible study, who helped me through the transformation process, um, who is somebody I look up to in so many different ways that guides our student athletes. And as I started the show, it's how do we surround ourselves, how do we surround our students with people that are in positive influences ways. And so Angie is one of those pieces that's able to help guide our programs and teams. And there's a thing about mental health with our student athletes, and it's been uh, a big push by the NCAA. And whether an NCAA or not, it's still a big push by us mm-hmm. that if we provide somebody for somebody to reach out to, it doesn't necessarily have to be a coach or, but somebody that's a mentor. It, that's just another positive touch point that we can get to. Yeah. And we're even here at Winthrop transforming from not just reacting in some ways to mental health, and we've got an incredible. Uh, mental health counselor and Dr. Sherry, who's our sports psychologist first, who helped me and our program get to a championship in 2019 for volleyball. But um, we're also working towards leadership now, too. And I think this is a university-driven thing. And in athletics, this is something that we happen to want to be doing, too. As I said, it's um, we, we want to develop leaders that graduate as, as champions is, is part of our goal. And so leadership development that mm-hmm. I truly believe that there is 
a proactive approach to helping mental health. And, and to me, that's developing better leaders and leadership. And so everybody on a team can be a leader, um, whether you're a freshman or not. You can be a leader of choosing the music. You can be the leader of what you wear on the bus that particular day, mm-hmm. all the way up through uh, you know the, uh, the seniors that could become a true captain for the program. Did you know that over 13 million 941 forms are e-filed annually? Don't keep filing on paper. Join the millions and switch to e-filing this tax season. TaxBandits.com makes e-filing easy with quick and secure filing and an audit check to help you avoid common errors. E-file now at TaxBandits.com. typically are working with college students, but you're also raising kids at the same time. Mm -hmm. Um, I've got kids myself. What kind of uh, recommendations do you have for uh, advocating (laughs) for (laughs) for different athletic uh, (laughs) specialization paths? Uh, Are you an advocate for early specialization from a young age or or a generalized approach? Um, I was listening to this Mm -hmm. David David Epstein argument of sort of the Tiger Woods approach where you early specialize or the Mm -hmm. sort of Roger Federer type approach where you have a general uh, approach early on and then you fine tune it when you get older. I I don't know if I should be saying this as an athletic director, but I've got eight-year-old twins. Yeah. And I tell everybody, run. (laughs) Run run away from it. (laughs) I I call them cults, these these travel teams, or I call them Mm. fraternities or sororities because they get involved in it. It's ironic, um, you know, my son, he, he's not super athletic. He could be if he wanted to. It's just not what he chooses, I think, because yeah. he has two parents that were both collegiate athletes and were too competitive, and we probably scared the competitiveness out of him. <laughs> but uh, he got involved in robotics, and the next thing you know is we're traveling for robotics at eight years oh, old. Okay. We're like, hold on, we, we can't do that. But, um, <laughs> you, you know, there's a the health, health factor of specializing too early yeah. that uh, the overuse injuries, to me, are obvious, even as a coach um, and, and now as an athletic director, I see it on a broader scale that – these students come in here and are more injured than, in my opinion, what they were when I first started coaching. Wow. And, mm. and the injuries aren't just, uh, you know, soreness, sprained ankle injuries. They're, they're major injuries, surgery-type yeah. injuries that, um, you know, put out a, a student-athlete for a year, if not a career. So, mm. uh, and, and, you know, on the coaching side, I was just, just talking to somebody about this the other day. You, you have kids that start 8, 9, 10 years old now, uh, you, you watch them get, get through to their 14, 15 years old. You spend, you know, a million dollars getting them to wherever they need to go over those particular years. Right. And these parents are thinking they're going to get a Division One, you know, or any scholarship. And yeah. 3% of the student, uh, you know, sports population are going to get some type of opportunity to play in college, not even scholarship-wise. Hmm. And, and then they find, um, y- you know, somebody that's, six foot eight that all of a sudden jumps 50 inches mm. and they, they can't they can't play the sport but all of a sudden that person's getting the scholarship mm-hmm. and, and the young the young you know a boy or girl that's been playing for 10 years right. you know that's you know average age average height average speed one in a million or those are going to get to the next, and I don't mean to call out the Broman brothers on this. If you don't know the Broman brothers, you need to get them on the show because they're amazing. They're basketball guys here in town, but uh, they're average height. No offense, guys. Uh, maybe a little bit taller than me, but they could shoot the rock, and, and they were known. I mean, I think one of the two of them, if not both of them, were close to 50 points a game they scored in their high school in Minnesota where they grew up, yeah. and so they were just super disciplined. They, they had the right attitude, and they did all the right things, and when you get somebody like that, they're going to be somebody that could make an opportunity to get on a team, and they did, and they flourished when they get there, but those are so few and far between. It's these physical anomalies that are going to end up getting there, and so mm-hmm. um, you got to enjoy your life, and, yeah. and there are some great positive benefits to club sports. I've been a club coach. I, I love the camaraderie of the of the team. I love the camaraderie of the parents. I mean, honestly, they, they can get to you sometimes, but for the most part, if you put together the right um, uh, um, structure to what they're doing, mm-hmm. they're, they're going to help the program and help what you need. And it, it, it is a lot of fun. And you do get times with your kids driving to wherever you want to go in the car or at night in a hotel room with them that you never would get because of what traditional probably you and I are used to with the local high school or local yeah. park district rec league. And that's mm-hmm. all you kind of had. So I, I don't knock it for what it is. There is some great benefits to it. Um, 
is that what I'm going to do for my kids right now? No, mm -hmm. but I also told said that I wasn't going to feed my kids pizza and chicken nuggets, and, <laughs> and I think that's all they eat for every meal too. <laughs> so uh, um, hey. there's got to be a balance, and yeah. I think the that pendulum has just swung a little bit too far right now. And so if we can find some balance in what we're doing in those ways, it would be much better. Awesome, appreciate it. Um, now these are just some personal ones for you. Uh, do you have a favorite sneaker brand? Well, we're we're or sponsored by Adidas here, Adidas. so, so that's, I, I, that's I, gotta have, be the I have to be Adidas. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Nice. Favorite go-to uh, sports drink? Um, I'm trying to think if we're sponsored by anybody, and, and if I need to say something. <laughs> it's funny, we're actually You're drinking Chick-fil-A now. Uh, yeah, so I don't can't tell anyone, it. although uh, Chad's a good friend of ours, and yeah. Suzanne, the, the people that own Chick-fil-A and Cherry Road, oh, yeah, good, good yeah. people. But... Um, um, you know, we're actually working with a couple of different sports drink companies. Coca-Cola has been a, a huge sponsor of Winthrop yeah. Athletics and the university for a long, long time. That's true. Um, and, and so are, are they Powerade? I'm going to say Powerade. Powerade yeah, it is. I guess it is. Powerade <laughs> is a Coke drink, isn't it? So, yeah. yeah. All right. Um, what what, what non-marketing okay, so non questions so, so, so you have? So these are both <laughs> I'm just like kidding. Sort of heavily <laughs> influenced. No, you're good. Um, it's actually good. This way I get my sponsors out there okay. too. And so. I'm pretty sure this one isn't a sponsored one. So what's what's your favorite sports or uh, sport team to watch other than Winthrop games? Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm a Chicago fan. So mm -hmm. I grew up with the Cubs. I yeah. got a chance, you know. You get to Wrigley Field for lunchtime for uh, my high school. You know, you ditch out a couple classes, and then your teachers see you on TV. Like, hey, yeah. what were you doing? Are you missing my class? Uh, I was having it's a, a real, hot dog. Like, Ferris Bueller moment. Right? Huge, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it awesome. actually happened to somebody in my class one time. So <laughs> maybe Ferris Bueller, they got that from from what happened to my buddy. Um, you know, Bulls, Bears, um, and I've really just enjoyed watching hockey a lot. But I, I, you know, I, I love the. Uh, I love our local teams. I really want to be more of a Panthers fan. There's mm -hmm. reasons why that I can't be right now, in my right. opinion. I won't say that out loud, but yeah. um, I love going to Knight Stadium. They do an amazing job. Then the Hornets, too. That's I cool. was really excited. We had Xavier Cooks, which is the first player um, from the Big South Conference who played for Winthrop that uh, made it in the NBA. Not just made it, but he, um, he earned some playing time with the Washington Wizards, and so we were excited for him to come That's down cool. to play at the, Heart, uh, at the Hornets Arena this, nice. this particular year. But unfortunately, he got cut from the Wizards. He actually looks right. like going back to the NBL or ABL down in Australia, getting okay. one of the biggest contracts ever. Just a really good, good, right. good person. And so... Um, you know, what a, I became a, a Wizards fan for a little yeah. bit there. Yeah. <laughs> nice. How about that? Yeah. Um, what, uh, what are you listening to right now? A Christian radio. Christian that, radio. That, that really yeah. is. Yeah. It's, uh, it, it settles me. Um, you know, encouraging radio that, mm -hmm. uh, has to, has to, as I drive home, just takes my mind mm -hmm. off the day. Um, my wife is the music person, yeah. so uh, she would say that I don't listen to anything yeah. because we can go on a long road trip and I don't have to have the music. I don't <laughs> oh, have anything on you don't, when I get oh, some man. peace and silence. Good uh, with the silence, just yeah. because my day is nonstop, nonstop thinking. Which yeah. it's good to have the silence, but sometimes my thoughts need to be, you know, diverted, and yeah. that's when I turn on the radio in yeah. those ways. Yeah. Yeah. You're more of a radio person, not not doing a I, I am more radio. Yeah, like my that. wife's more, you know, playlist. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Awesome. Yep. Um, anything you're reading right now? Uh, I actually am, am reading uh, Little Victories by Jason Gay. Um, he is the Wall Street Journal writer that um, wrote the article for us for Cornhole. Okay. And so he called me up. We started talking a little bit. And so I got to know him just a touch by that call. And so I told him I was going to order his book. Now, I only told him that I was going to order his book so I can kind of brown nose a little bit, <laughs> that maybe he's like, oh, this guy's interested in me. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll get some more articles written about us in the Wall Street Journal, right? And, and it's funny because as I read his book, there's a lot of parallels in his life and my life in some ways. And so I really am truly enjoying reading his book. And yeah. uh, um, it's, uh, it's a bit of a comedy, a bit of a parody, and it's um, a lot of hyperbole in it. And it's just some easy reading right now that I've really, I've really enjoyed. Fantastic. So, yeah. Um, do you get time to watch anything other than sports? Yeah. So you, watch, you have any uh, TV shows, movies, things yeah, like that? You're enjoying? Not, nothing much. You know, watch my kids. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. you know what life's about for me right yeah. now. When I get home, you know, I watch. And like I said, typically my wife is watching, what, what you know, The Bachelor, whatever she likes to watch. Yeah. I think we watched it last night, <laughs> and um, I, I literally had the hockey game on my phone, and that's that, how we spend the night <laughs> you know, together. Yep. Awesome. Well, I think we'll transition to a little "Would you yeah. rather" uh -oh. game. This, these always scare me. I, so uh, I was saying earlier, I'm really hard. competitive, so if these I can't aren't. come up with it right away, uh, okay. I'm well, kidding you. <laughs> Do you want to ask the question? Sure. Sure. All right. Uh, we got 
six of these, so not too many. Um, would you rather be a mascot for the day or drive a Zamboni? Zamboni. Can, can I give reasons yeah, why, yeah, too? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I, I don't mean to go off on crazy tangents, but I'm going to. <laughs> no, um, one of our great sponsors, Atrium Health, they have a uh, um, Children's Levine Center here in town, and we had to get the big stuff, our mascot, over yeah. to there. And we couldn't find anybody getting the costume. So it wasn't me that got into it, uh, my, my wife. Oh. <laughs> but as she got into it, she said it was so hot in there yeah. that uh, she said it was it was too. She took, it's funny because we had to like kind of go hide in the corner because when she took the head off, we didn't want a whole bunch of kids around to see that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you got to keep know, this the, bird came out, right? keep the illusion. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Right. So too hot. It was too yeah, hot. Too yeah. Hot got it. That, yeah. So. Got it. Would you rather play alongside your best friend or beat your rival? Beat my rival. Mm-hmm. Just competitive, competitive yeah, yeah. yeah. Totally. Would you rather go undefeated on the road or at home? Well, in 2019, our our volleyball team went undefeated on the road and at home. So, I, I, can I so, say both? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> totally. If you had to choose, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know what's interesting You'll about sports, though, is that sometimes it's harder to play at home than it is on the road. Mm. Uh, and I, I say this like, if uh, if you go to a party. And you go to somebody's house, it's pretty easy. You show up, you go to the party, you leave, it's a mess, and that's just the way it is. But yeah. when you host the party, you got a lot more stuff. You got people calling you, things. Well, it's no different than a student athlete yeah. where they have friends and family all coming in, expectations. And so it's funny because sometimes our teams don't start off really well. But, oh, I do, well. They're at home. Why can't they start off so well? Well, there's a lot of different pressures on them. And it's not yeah. just... It's not just mm. during the game. It's before the game and after the game. It's the night before when parents are coming in town or mm. grandma and grandpa that they haven't seen in 30 years. All of a sudden, they show up, and this kid's in tears right before the game. You're like, why couldn't you tell us that they were coming before? You Don't, don't surprise us. Mm. So, yeah. So you could be more focused on the road. Very much so. Your, your, yeah. your whole experience is about the game. It's, whereas, and the team. Yeah, you yeah. really bond as a team. Right. You, you know, when you talk about student athletes, some of the greatest experience, it's on the bus. Mm-hmm. You know, our women's soccer team had an incredible um, TikTok that it was like 3 million views that came because they're doing some pretty cool stuff on the bus. Yeah. And that's the stuff that nice. when you ask any most student athletes what they enjoy most, it's their teammates. Yeah. Would you rather have your fans be like riotous, rushing the field, or be just dead silent and not into it at all. <laughs> One extreme or the other. Yeah, I don't, yeah. Know, I don't know why you'd want them quiet. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, you know, obviously you don't I'd want them. I'd rather have a riot. Yeah. 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 yeah, you see people storming the court now. That's becoming an issue because, yeah. uh, you know, the, the one young man got kind of hit by uh, some students as they were rushing the court in those particular ways. Yeah. yeah. You know, going back, our fan base has always been classy and yeah. been very impressed with who they are. And mm-hmm. even before one of our games this year, we had a team coming in that a coach got in trouble and it was public news. And, you know, I reached out to uh, our student athletes and I said, uh, to our, our, our flock, uh, the Belly Brothers, as a matter of fact, Alex mm-hmm. and, and Josh. And I said, hey, guys, can you just make sure that we don't go down that road? And they're like, listen, we already got you covered. We've already put a, you know, a newsletter out about nice. it and stuff like that. And so um, they, they can be crazy in, in a good way. And we really appreciate it. Mm-hmm. Would you rather win or have a good time out there? Yeah, <laughs> there's, no, there's no question about winning. Yeah, <laughs> I, I have to. If we, if we don't win, I get in trouble. I might yeah, not have totally. a job, too. So. Definitely. Would you rather have a small but dedicated fan base or a large but disconnected fan base? Mm, I, I love the small dedicated. Um, mm-hmm. We have, in the past... Um, had some great crowds. We filled the Coliseum before for some of our basketball games, um, and we haven't gotten back to that yet. And as, as I said at one time, we've got a great family here, and it's pretty cool that the past couple of years the family's coming back. Mm-hmm. And so um, we've really our attendance this past year, and not just in basketball. We had over 500 a softball game this year already. We had over 500 for women's uh, soccer game. We've had mm-hmm. our best attended crowds um, for baseball in a long time. We sold out the stadium for USC when they came in last year for baseball, nice. uh, North Carolina for softball this year when they came in. We, we can grow a fan base, and that's what we need to do. There people here in Rock Hill are very loyal, and, and they love Winthrop, and they love Winthrop Athletics, and as you get to know them, as you get to know us, um, they, they just, you want to follow them. And so our goal here is, is that it, it's, it's kind of funny, you know, going to church here at North Rock Hill, I had some people that grew up in Rock Hill. I'm like, oh, we don't cross the river to Fort Mill. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, well, we need to. And, and we're starting to get a lot more people from Fort Mill. I mean, I, there's been a place I've been to, like I've been up in Fort Mill, like you have a college down in Rock Hill. And I'm like, seriously, you know, come <laughs> on down. And so we're ex- right. We can grow our fan base, and that's what we're doing. I'm really yeah. proud of our team for doing that and growing it, and this year has been an exception, and it's only going to get better. 
I, I, I got a, fi- a final plug, and, yeah, and yeah, I, yeah, I, I got to make sure as we talk yeah. about growing our fan base, fan base, it's through our Eagle Club. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, go to WinthropEagles.com, um, go to our, our our donate now, and don't have to donate, but it's part of our Eagle Club, and you know, our Eagle Club helps our student athletes not just get to places or get things, but it's also for scholarships. Um, we're not fully funded all our teams in terms of scholarship dollars and opportunities, and or even books. Books are expensive now. Mm-hmm. It's like four hundred dollars for a chemistry book. It's mm-hmm. ridiculous. Um, to help out our student athletes in those ways. And so, um, you know, we're not looking for as much the treasures of people, but their, their time and their talents. Um, just come to a game and, and we, we want you to bring a friend. And, and our loyal fan base is doing that. They're bringing friends along. As you said, you came to a game this year. You heard Brian rushing, amazing job in the yeah. PA. I, I hope you thought the atmosphere was great and that, you know, you'd want to come back. And, and that's what our goal is to have our people come back to surround our student athletes. We have amazing, amazing student athletes here at Winthrop that do amazing things. I mean, our softball pitcher, Reese, is a 4.0 that did something with orthopedic surgery as her internship this past summer. And and it's not just her. We have so many stories like that here at Winthrop that if you will surround them and help them to grow, there's no better gift than you can give somebody than education. And if you can do that through uh, Winthrop Eagles and uh, WinthropEagles.com and our Eagle Club, that would be much appreciated. Awesome. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Any final thoughts other than that? This has been great. I'm glad you guys do this. Thanks for putting this out there and being part of the community in this way. Of course. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. This concludes our episode of The Bandit Room. Stick around next week and see what we talk about. The Bandit Room is a production of Span Enterprises, located in sunny Rock Hill, South Carolina. We've been developing, supporting, and growing successful IRS e-filing and business management solutions since 2010. Go to SpanEnterprises.com now to learn more. The views and opinions expressed in the Bandit Room are those of the guests and do not necessarily reflect or state the opinions of Span Enterprises. No information should be considered as tax, legal, or other professional advice.